welcome to Solutions with Courtney Anderson. I am Courtney Anderson. Thank you for joining me today. It always makes me happy to know that you have taken time out of your life to share with me in the program today. Now today we have a, an episode that is part of the Help Situation Spotlight series. And this, of course, is our series based on exactly what it sounds like. Help! H-E-L-P, help me! Uh, Community members like yourself share concerns, questions, ideas with me um, through the program, through speeches I give. People reach out to me and ask, hey, help! So what I'm trying to do is come up with potential solution sets. I, of course, as we share in all the programs, am here to do everything that I can do to help you surpass your goals. So not just to meet them, to surpass them, because you should always be able to get to a point in life where you you surprise yourself with what happens, because it was more than you dreamed it would be. And then to sustain, not that exact goal, but sustain that process of of surpassing new goals and continuing to climb new mountains, Um, keeping life exciting, right? All the things that we, you know, sometimes associate with sort of a privileged life, certainly, um, not in the uh, middle of a war or famine or some other um, horrific circumstance, but, you know, sort of the, the the very fortunate modern life where someone will say, oh, I'm just bored. Oh, there's nothing left that's exciting anymore. Oh. And what we're trying to do is understand that, okay, it's not something where you just sort of sit around in life and then here comes, oh, an adventure. Wow. Oh, comes something exciting. Oh, look at that. I never thought that would happen to me. Woo. Like you have to do things. And this is, we talk about all the time in the programs. Luck, right? Just sort of, hey, I was doing nothing. And look, I won the lottery or, you know, someone that was, you know, a, roy- a royalty came and found me and married me and swept me off my feet and took me to a life of untold wealth. Okay. All those things could happen and they may happen. I don't know, but I don't have anything I can offer to you to do as a step as part of a process potentially to improve the, improve the probability. Um, other than some basic things, like if you want to win the lottery, then you need to go buy a lotto ticket. Uh, you know, beyond that, I really can't offer much. So that's why we don't spend time on that, on those sort of luck things. Because if they happen, they'll happen. Great. That's just sort of an extra awesome thing that happened. What we're trying to do is create a pattern and a practice where your life is, again, more than you thought it would be. So we don't get in that sort of, you know, discussion with ourselves, with other people. Oh, this is, is this all there is? I just thought I would be, you know, so much more. I thought they would be, you know, I thought it would be better, you know, and people get in very negative places. Um, and we, why do that? So we're, again, we're talking ag- again into a very, very, you know, privileged life, but we still have to take responsibility um, for our outcomes. And so when we look at the help situation uh, spotlight series, we're trying to figure out, you know, what are some potential solutions that you may employ to, to solve whatever you've identified as a potential issue right now, but also in the bigger picture and framework of your life to get to a point where you're continually you wake up and you feel you feel kind of you know excited what's gonna happen in a good way not like the most exciting thing ever but you know more often than not it's good what's good life that's what I mean so when we look at that of course I also am doing everything I can within this uh, solution set that I'm suggesting to to further (laughs) um, my defined uh, outcome where that you and I and everyone is practicing a joyful art of business so that whatever it is we're doing whether it's uh, for pay or volunteer that we feel good about it that's the thing where I said that it life is good right so not every moment is you know ecstasy but it's over over time you kind of feel like eh. even if you're a huge cynic you'd say well I'll stay around nice stuff happens I'm not bored Every once in a while, something really good happens. And you're trying to also, at the same time, of course, prevent choices that are going to lead to really bad outcomes, right? And then, if something great happens with good luck, awesome. And, we talk about in other programs, if something horrible happens with what people call bad luck, you know, the hurricane hits your house, um, you know, some horrible illness befalls you and or your loved ones, um, you know, you were better positioned to handle it and you've planned ahead uh, so that you 
give yourself more opportunities to try to come out of that in a better situation. It may be something as simple as, hey, I paid my insurance and kept my premiums up to date. So, yep, the hurricane hit my house, but I have full coverage um, and it's got a good replacement value. So it's a hassle, but I'm okay. You know, I'm safe. I have a place to stay. I've got some, I've got income. I've got resources, everything, you know, it's not great, but hey, you put your, you just try to put yourself in the best possible position. If something great happens, that's just super awesome. If something horrible happens, it's not great, but you can handle it. And you're in the best position you could possibly be to get ready for good, you know, the, for, for making a, the best outcome. So all that's to say that that's the framework of what we do. So in this specific show, within all of that framework, our topic is, I am addicted to approval from everyone. Help! I am addicted to approval from everyone. All right. Now, this has, uh, was a show topic that was uh, suggested by some community members, and I have honestly had <laughs> this show topic mentioned numerous times over all of the conferences and keynotes and speeches and corporate education programs that I have done. I mean, it's just a really popular topic. So here we are, and let's delve into it and see if there's anything we could possibly offer as potential solution sets for someone whose situation is that, hey, they are addicted, addicted to approval. I'm going to first do what I often do, right? Almost, I was going to say it was like uh, an old Batman uh, at least they had an old Batman television show when I was younger uh, that was on in uh, reruns. Um, and something would happen in the episode and then the Batman character would say, to the Batcave, right? Like, we're going get, to get moving towards solving this, right? I was going to say, to the Batcave um, for our going to the dictionary. <laughs> because so many times in episodes, you'll we'll start talking about something and then what I'll do is put def- dictionary definitions down for a couple of reasons. A, what does it mean? We have to make sure we understand what it means, right? Are we are we accurate in the description of this potential problem? Um, and then it also gives us often a starting point for potential solution sets. So to our version of the Bat Cave, which is our dictionary. <laughs> and what do I see in my dictionary? I have two key words in this episode topic. And actually, I have, th- I have three. But let's start with the first one. Um, I have addicted right? Addicted. So let's look. I looked at the dictionary. What does it say? Addicted. It says a strong and harmful need Hmm. to regularly have something such as a drug or do something such as gamble. I'm going to reread that. A strong and harmful need to regularly have something such as a drug or do something such as gamble. It also says in the dictionary, an unusually great interest in something or a need to do or have something. Wow. So the first part of that uh, definition talked about a harmful need. That says a lot, right? So all the things we're talking about, meeting, surpassing our goals, practicing the joyful art of business, difficult to do that if I'm harming myself. <laughs> If I'm engaging in something that's harmful. The second part of it says you're asking for permission to do something. I'm sorry. It says that the second part of the addicted addi- definition says, and this is in the show notes, an unusually great interest in something or a need to do or have something. Now let's look at the definition of approval, which is in the show notes. Uh, approval definition, it starts off, it says, the belief that something or someone is good or acceptable. A good opinion of someone or something. And then, which I misread a few minutes ago, the second part of our approval definition is permission to do something. Acceptance of an idea, action, plan, etc. All right, so let's look at it. Addiction, first op- option for our addiction definition says it's a harmful need. I have a strong and harmful need. Wow. Or I have an unusually great interest. Okay, that sounds a little less negative. For approval, it says I have a belief 
that someone or something is good or acceptable or permission to do something. You've given me approval for acceptance of an idea, action, or plan. So often when people come in and talk to me about um, this, this idea and they say, help, I'm addicted to approval from everyone. Initially, my first inclination is to think about that first part of the approval definition, the idea that they are seeking someone else to, to validate them, to tell them that you're good. You're good, you're acceptable, you're good enough. The second part of this, though, is equally interesting and pervasive. The second part is that you're asking for someone else to tell you it's okay to do something, which reframes your entire life, right? And it's, this, is, this is so interesting. Now, this is one of the shows that fascinates me, but I'm, I don't have a lot of anecdotal personal experience. Um, I'm going to make this a positive. One of the things I think of my life journey is I just have not been in a position where I often have had to or felt I had to or even to be really fair had the option to <laughs> ask somebody for approval. For example, I was watching uh, my relaxation uh, TV time. Uh, the, the other day and I was I'd like to watch these real estate shows now I've we do other programs you know how much I love real estate you know I've been in a uh, real estate uh, landlord and investor in residential property for what year is this probably uh, I guess well about about 12 13 years now okay so that on the table that I love real estate I was watching one of the real estate shows I love and these are this is these shows for somebody who doesn't love real estate it I can see you wouldn't want to watch it but it's it's there are literally several of these shows all around the world that people go and they look at real estate <laughs> that's the whole show sometimes they look at real estate and they look about the outside how they're going to change the the lawn and the landscaping and sort of the outside the curb appeal they call it sometimes they go inside and they look at places they're going to buy potentially sometimes they look at places they might buy and fix up you know like sort of you know enhance and improve sometimes they look at they're just going to buy something in different you know parts of the world so the, some of the shows i watch i go to different you know cities all over the world and i like that too because then i get to either think about when i was in that place or think well i've never been there i'd like to go so i was watching one of my real estate shows and they had um people it was one of the shows where people go look at places that they, they're going to buy right so they're like i'm going to go buy a place you know let's go look and I don't remember where in the world they were, but they were looking, and it happened to be a couple, right? So it was two, you know, adults in a in a family relationship. Um, and I can't remember, I don't remember if they were legally married or just, you know, had made a commitment to each other. But they were, you know, in, in a relationship, and they were buying property. Okay, so <laughs> the thing is, in watching the show, they start talking to each other, and they start throughout the episode you know they'll go look at a property and then they'll you know talk to each other and and say what they liked and didn't like and it was interesting because I've bought you know several homes but I've never done it with another person like it's you know just me so you know I'll think in my own head do I like this or that or you know or that's a deal breaker or, oh I can't believe this is so awesome but I've never had any discussion with anybody else I mean, I've discussed things with my, you know, like if I, I used a realtor, I, I discussed, you know, the offering price or something of that or what some of the research the realtor had to share with me about the, you know, the, the numbers on other similar properties. But I never had anybody else to actually share the decision making. So this idea of permission to do something, I was watching the show and I was thinking how different that would be, you know, because – I go and I, I mean, I have, you know, I make all my, you know, there's a lot that everybody has to do. It's the same, right? Like, okay, you know, I either have the cash or, you know, or I'm going to, you know, borrow some or all of this. And then I need to, if I'm going to borrow it, then I need to go to the, well, in, in either event, I need to make, you know, where are my funds? So if it's cash, where is it? You know, am I going to wire that? How's this going to work? If it's, um, you know, what are, are there any, because the restrictions and all kind of stuff, right? Like how much money you can wire and when and all this kind of paperwork you have to fill out, how far in advance. And then if I'm going to finance some of it, then, um, okay, well, who am I going to borrow it from? What would be the terms? What's the best deal, you know, in terms of interest and, and time, um, you know. So there's a lot of, you know, you, you have to do all that. So everyone has to do all of that, but I, but I never had, to, I had never actually stopped to think about how different it would be if, if after all that stuff that everybody has to do is done, like how you'll buy it, the, the part about what you'll buy. 
Um, or even that, I guess, even the how you'll buy it, if you had someone else that you needed approval would be different. Because what if one person was like, let's spend cash? And the other person was like, I don't want to spend cash. We should you know, be better for our credit score if we go out and we, we finance part of this. I, you know, honestly, I just hadn't really thought of it. And it does change the framework of your, so much of your life because you're asking somebody else for permission. And it's interesting because when I was watching the show, I was thinking, you know, how do you negotiate that? You know, what if one person says something, the other person is like, absolutely not. You know, what do you do? Do you move into something or agree to some deal that, you know, then you just seethe, you know, for for however long you're there thinking, ah, I hated this place. Like, I never wanted it because this is an ugly, you know, garage or something. And now I'm stuck with it. And I, it's interesting. So I don't have a lot of of experience personally with the approval to do something because I, I, I would love to. I mean, I've, you know, sort of shared other programs, like. And I'm, I'm a positive person, right? So, you know, who knows when my circumstances will change the future. I'd love to be, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a relationship. I'm, you know, certainly open and, and excited about that, to that possibility. But if I, it doesn't, it hasn't existed. So I just had to go out and live somewhere. And I felt like I needed to invest in, in, in uh, real estate for, for rentals and for me to live in. So I just did it. So I don't know a lot personally about what it's like to have to go ask somebody else for permission I just haven't been in that position but it's but it was interesting because when I started to think about it I thought how totally drastically different that would be it would just change the calculus of everything and it would it would also put huge upside you know like you're not you're not alone you have somebody else to to help you or to to be there if something happens to you or but you also have risk like, you really have to trust that other person if you're making these huge decisions together, right? Financially, where you're going to live, lifestyle, this kind of stuff. Um, so, in, in, you know, fair honesty, I just don't have a lot of personal understanding of it. Um, and even, I know I was talking to a friend the other day that I've had for, you know, a really long time. And we had gone to dinner years ago uh, with a... a a friend of hers from her job and and so the we were talking at dinner and and the person was her friend from her job was saying something like she wanted to buy something I don't remember what it was but I don't know jewelry or something or some something and and then she was saying something like she had to ask um her her spouse and I had again like not thought of that I never thought like how interesting. I mean, I understood certainly when, you know, as a child, when I, you know, you have to ask your, your parents or caregivers or grandparents or foster parents or whoever, you know, can I do something because you're not able yourself because you're a child, but I hadn't as an adult really experienced it. So all that's to say, the idea that someone feels that they're addicted to approval from everyone is unusual from my perspective because I feel like the challenge with addicted to approval is and the two flavors, the one flavor I've been talking about a lot here is the permission to do something. So it makes sense. Obviously, when you form a family with someone, it's all about, you know, trust and, and, and sharing. We share our decisions. We share the consequences. We share the good things. Um, and so that's – but that's an investment, right? That's why people – ideally uh, take a lot of time making sure that they're with the right person uh, for them and that they have shared sense of, of values and expectations. I have, I've mentioned in other uh, settings, seen a lot of marriages that didn't work, uh, especially when I have done divorce, divorce law, family law as an attorney. Uh, and it, and, and, and it's awful, you know, the amount of anger and hatred and and rage in family law cases um, is, it just, it surpasses almost everything. You know, forget criminal law, which is where people have been accused of crimes. That's not very stressful at all. I didn't find it typically. I mean, most of, sometimes there would be some horrible criminal act that itself is just, you know, overwhelmingly uh, stressful. But most of the time, you know, minor issues, somebody possessed, you know, small amount of, of drugs, somebody, you know, was speeding down the road too fast, somebody, you know, um, those cases aren't that stressful. And the people aren't angry. Um, the family law cases are highly stressful because the people are just enraged. And I had, you know, again, cause I've never experienced it. Um, but when I watch the show and now that when we're doing this show about a predicting to approval, I can kind of see why, right? Like if you've made all these sacrifices and compromises and sharing, 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 and then somebody just pulls the rug out from underneath it. And what was the point of all of it then? It just seems like that, you know, obviously that would be. You know, but it's as the lawyer in those cases, it's just very difficult because you can't it's well, you, you can, but it's very challenging to get people to think rationally and make choices about things because everything's so emotionally laden, you know, with just meaning, you know, so people will fight over, you know, just 
everything, you know, plates and things that don't have monetary value, but it's all about, you know, their emotion, right? So this idea of having asked for approval as an adult, it is challenging. It, of course, is part of any relationship that's based on the potentially best outcome, right? You've, you've made commitments to each other, whether it was in a formal legal arrangement or not, and, and now you're sharing. So I think there has to be a healthy balance to make sure that you're doing so in a way that's beneficial to everybody. Now, the really great thing is that this show is entitled, I'm Addicted to Approval from Everyone. So we're not talking about this thing about permission to do something, ideally. Ideally, it makes sense if you're asking your your, your spouse or, you know, partner, hey, you know, we're, we're going to buy some place where we're going to live. That makes sense. <laughs> but, um, you know, even when I had roommates, right, like when I was thinking back when I was in college and I had roommates. So you have to ask a roommate, right, because we both share the same place. So, like, I can't just, you know take abuse our our physical shared space i have to ask my roommate that's not an unhealthy thing you shouldn't be asking permission to do something from everyone right like the show title our show title says um that would be really an extreme situation what i most of the time when we're talking about people who are addicted to approval it's this first part where they are they have they want they 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 yearn for other people and in our show title they want everyone to tell them that they're good or acceptable they want a good opinion from everyone and it just and that's when it becomes you know very harmful right we looked at our addicted uh, definition in the show notes it becomes really harmful because they just run around the world everyone you know i'm at the market oh i need the person at the checkout line to approve you know think i'm a good person um i'm at the you know gas station and i'm filling up my car with gas i need the people there to think i'm a i'm a good person uh, i'm out to dinner you know, with some friends, and I need my, you know, the person who's the, 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 you know, the, the, that's our weight person. I want them to think I'm good enough. It's just sort of, that orientation to the world would be overwhelming, and that's why when people share this with me, and I, and I certainly have, you know, read into some of the ram, ramifications of this. Now, there's some things that you'll read that will try to argue it's more of a gender issue that quote the disease to please, right? that the disease to please is more of a, uh, it's something that orient, uh, oriented to more, more toward women and for females. I actually, I don't know if that's a, if that's something that we can blame on chromosomes or that's something that we can say that cultures and societies sort of reinforce their stereotypes. Um, I think that people who are brought up under certain conditions where they have an underlying belief system that they're not good enough that they're not acceptable, they're not good, that triggers then a lifetime sometimes without somebody changing it of them trying to fix that. So I'm, let's say that I'm an adult and I'm, I'm, let's say that I'm an adult and I'm 31 years old, which I have been. I'm not today. (laughs) Um, So let's say I'm an adult, I'm 31 years old and I grew up in a situation where a combination of, you know, my genes and my environment, so nature and nurture, I got the message that I'm not good enough. Now, sometimes, like I said, you get a situation where people um, come out of a a family that was very loving and very supportive, and and you talk to the caregivers and the siblings and everyone, and they'll say, all we did was tell this person how great they were. You know, we just did everything we could, try to make them, you know, feel better about themselves. And and you'll still have, somebody can come out of that environment and be 31 years old and just, and and mean it, though, and be in, in immense pain you know, and say, I'm not, I've never been good enough. I disappoint, I disappoint my, my family. I disappoint my friends. I'm not good enough. And even though the, the family and friends have done nothing but try to tell them how good they are in their minds, they've, they've accepted this belief and, and then they make decisions based around it, that they're not good enough. And so you have all kinds of really harmful behavior. You know, you got someone who says, I'm not good enough, you know, physically. My body is not good enough. And so you have people who have eating disorders, people who put themselves in, oh, my gosh, such a physical danger. And sometimes, you know, people die because they, oh, I'm not skinny enough. I'm not voluptuous enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not small. I mean, it's just, I'm not, uh, oh, the people, the people who feel their skin tone, their color isn't right. And people who, people bleach their, their skin and, and can harm themselves. And there are people who on the other side go out and excessively darken their skin and harm themselves. I mean, I don't know. It, it's, 
the amount of variety in how this this belief, the belief I'm not good enough, how it can manifest itself and everything from, you know, eating, you know, the body size to skin color. I saw a show in my television and relaxation time. <laughs> my television and relaxation time is like a very short hour or two in, in the evening and um, maybe a few days a week, maybe two days a week or something. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more depending on my schedule, but I don't really have a lot of it. So when I do it, I, I try to just turn my brain off and just, that's why I call it relaxation time. Sometimes I watch cartoons. Sometimes I, I mean, I really am not trying to do any heavy intellectual thought during my relaxation time. So I was watching a show about somebody who had one of these eating disorders, but they were, she, it was a woman and she was engorging herself. She just ate as many calories as she could. She was physically ill. She was in very bad health, but she had these things. I'm not good enough. And she'd gotten in with this, this sort of subculture uh, she was in the, in North America that 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 she would um, try to be as large as she could because there were people who uh, wanted people to be as large as they could. And then when she had found some uh, gentleman that she was – I can't remember if she was married with or living – but she was living with him. I, and, and he had found her through her – you know, being in this group where it's all about being as large as you can. And when she, her health was in, I mean, it was in really bad condition and she was trying to lose weight um, just for her health. I mean, she wasn't even really mobile. And the, and the man was angry at her and he was like, no, you can't do this. And he was a very small frame person, but it was, it, it was that same idea. You know, she fell, I'm not good enough. So she's going to abuse food. You know, like I said, some people withhold food from themselves and then they're emaciated and have all these horrible physical conditions and people die. Other people, she was doing the opposite, the same thing, though. She just was gorging herself with food, horrible physical conditions, of course, can die. People do die from that, too. And here's this person in her life. He's up there basically, you know, chastising her, you know, not giving her approval or permission. And he's telling her she has to eat more. I mean, she's losing too much weight. And it was it was cruel. But why would someone do that? Why would someone let somebody else... hurt them and, and turn them as a weapon against themselves. So to simplify it, addiction to approval is really belief that you're not good enough. And and so when you believe you're not good enough, and like I said, sometimes it comes out of environments where everyone around the person told them how great they were and was trying really hard to, to support and love and make them safe, and, and they still had this. And sometimes people come from environments where they had none of that. There was nobody anywhere near them that cared about them or paid any attention to them or ever said anything nice to them. People even abused neglected them, right? It doesn't – to me, that that's not the issue. The issue – I mean, it's, that's part of how it happens, you know? How does it happen that somebody uh, ends up believing that they, they're not good enough? But, but but what we're dealing with in this show is it has happened. And what are the ramifications of it? Well, the ramifications of believing you're not good enough is trying, again, I use the word fix, is, is trying, like I said, the 31-year-old sort of fictional woman we're looking at, most people don't even take the time to figure out where it came from. Now, that would be something you people can do on their own or people can do in conjunction with um, therapists and counselors um, in groups. Where you can take the time, put the work into figuring out where did this come from. Some people don't do that at all, which I find I find it odd because the consequences that are devastating of believing you're not good enough and running around basically to everybody. You know, I've known people socially who they they're oriented like this, right? So I'm not good enough, and and you'll 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 be somewhere with them, and you know, like I, you're you're at a, you're at a store and you're going to sit down and and have a you know, a coffee and you go order coffee and then the person, you know, you sit down and start talking to them and they start to say to you, oh, they didn't like me. And you're like, who didn't like you? Oh, the people, when I ordered my coffee, I ordered it, you know, the wrong way. And I could just tell the way they were looking at me. And, and, and I'll think like, what on earth are you talking about? The people are just selling coffee. Like this is their job. They don't care, you know, but it, it, the, the, the power of belief that you're not good enough. It's everything. And there are people who are just immobilized by this. People abuse their bodies. We've talked about that. People abuse their minds. People abuse substances and alcohol and drugs. Um, people abuse themselves. They withhold, you know, the uh, intimacy and friendships. They say, I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. I'll just sit alone. I don't deserve it. I just, I'll just, uh, no. I'll just be alone. I saw um, uh, a movie recently, and it was... Uh, the movie is entitled Her, 
and it has uh, Joaquin Phoenix is a, the the lead male actor. It's an, and it, it was interesting. It was about a, a man in, in sort of the future, and he falls in love with quote unquote his computer operating system. And they had a female voice. Uh, the actress uh, Scarlett Johansson was the sort of the voice you don't ever you know she's the computer voice sort of like you may have on your smartphone if you have on your smartphone a voice that, that you 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 can ask it apple has the siri product right and you can have the male voice or female voice and um it was like that and the man fell in love with the voice on his computer <laughs> and um it was interesting it reminded me of another movie i'd seen a few years ago uh lars and the real girl which has actor Ryan Gosling is in the male lead in that. It's a similar idea. There's this man, and he falls in love with a sort of an inflatable doll, like a toy, an adult toy, um, and like carries the big doll around and says it's his girlfriend. And but both of the stories have really similar in my mind. Now, I'm not a movie critic, but um, so I'm way on a limb here. But what I'm trying to make the argument is both of those movies have male characters who have very serious issues with intimacy, right? And I'm taking a guess, underlying that is this feeling I'm not good enough. So because of that, instead of abusing just your body or your mind, they decide that they're going to abuse their sort of their emotions. You're not, you're not really going to engage in real life healthy relationships. And so you're going to engage with imaginary relationships with your computer voice or a doll. And it sounds silly, but people do this all the time, especially with online. People, people say all the time, they'll say, oh, those are my friends. And it's like, oh, you, you know, how long have you known them? What do you guys do together? Oh, no, I've never met them. This is my online friends. Okay, not saying don't have online friends, but we need to have real life experiences. If all you do is live in fantasy world, and some people do that, where they're, you know, when I was younger, they didn't have internet, obviously, but people had fantasy play. Especially, uh, I remember young people with Dungeons and Dragons and things like this. People, people always will engage in fantasy. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm saying don't only do that. Don't, don't let that be your only outlet. And, and often, if that's your only outlet not that oh you're doing that and your husband or wife is like hey put that video game down or we need to take a break i'm saying that that's all you have those are your only human interactions that underlying that and often in many instances is this feeling i'm not good enough so i'm not i don't want to risk going out into real life somebody might reject me or hurt my feelings and i'd be too scared and would overwhelm me so i'll just i'll just make everything so quote safe right like i'll just hide and and this way even if something bad happens they're they're imaginary and it's unhealthy and it, on my mind, is driven at some level by this situation where you don't think you're good enough. If you have addiction to approval from everyone, it's not a joke. If that, if the real situation is this, you want someone else to tell you you're good enough because you don't think you are, then my strong suggestion, I am not obviously able to give any professional advice in any of this, you know, beyond the framework of what we do. I'm not a mental health professional or anything of that nature. Um, this is something you cannot ignore. Other people do not have the ability to fix this. Only you have the ability to convert from believing you're not good enough and going out and trying to make other people proxies to kind of find in someone else that you're good enough or you have you have to convert to believe you're good enough if you don't convert and you keep going out and you're looking everywhere the person at the grocery store um your friend that you went to lunch with and you're just constantly trying to have them cure this it puts so much pressure on other people and it makes the other person who does care about you, and we've talked about this in other programs, when I talk about how do you know that somebody cares about you, how do you know that somebody um, is your friend, uh, we talked about this. The first thing that we know is that um, it, if my happiness is their happiness, that's the test. If somebody is somebody who cares about you and they want you to be happy and you're miserable because you're addicted to approval from other people and most of it is just imaginary, the person at the grocery store, I guarantee you they didn't think about this more than just finishing whatever their task was to serve you as a customer you're not that big of a role in their life you just were a customer getting coffee they're not approving or disapproving you have an unrealistic orientation where you you're looking for something that's not there most of it is that the world we're just all busy how many people do you approve of 
you know, you turn around on people and, and you ask them, you know, what did you think of the coffee person, right? Instead of all this sort of narcissistic focus on what you imagine other people think about you, which is, again, it's narcissistic because you think the idea that you think other people are thinking about you that much. We've done other shows about this. They're not thinking about you because they're thinking about themselves, which is kind of healthy. You should think about yourself, too, in a healthy way, not in some sort of a imagined confirmation, you know, of the bias you already have that you're not good enough because you, you can read that in anything. Because it's imaginary. I strongly encourage you. If you believe that this is you. And you feel that. You, oh, they don't think I'm good enough. Oh the people there are looking at me. I didn't do a good job parking in the parking lot. Or I know at my job. They told me I was you know, doing a good job. But I just don't believe them. Or oh, I know my spouse said that I'm, you know, they love me. But I just don't trust them. Or I know I'm not good enough. They could find somebody you know, better than me. Or, you know, I mean this is so self-destructive. I see people do this with their own, just with anything. You know, I was going to say even with their own children, right? You'll, you'll, I'll talk to someone, and especially when I used to practice law, and I was in a lot of people's families' environments because it was my job, and I was trying to fix, you know, whatever, their family law problem or sometimes their uh, probate issue. Somebody died, right, and we're trying to figure out who gets what. And that's the other really high-stress type of practice where people are just so much rage and, and long-standing pain in families, and it comes out over these things in court, and so, I, you know, parents will say, oh, you know, they're, they have a child, and, and they'll, oh, I'm not a good enough mom, I'm not a good enough dad, and the poor kid's like, you're, I do, you're a great mom, you're a great dad, I love you, no, I could be so much better, I mean, it's so destructive, and, and it creates a whole other generation of people with no external hope, <laughs> having stability, I mean, it's just, okay, all we can do is offer solution sets, I'm going to tell you right now, Everyone else is not thinking about you. We've had other programs. We've talked about this. It's normal and healthy. No, There's no way in the world everybody else in the world is thinking about you all the time. It doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. They have to think about themselves and their kids and their spouse and their dog and their job and their foot and all the other things. Okay? So that's not logical that they're all sitting around thinking about you. When they do think about you, they're thinking about you usually in context of themselves. So if they're at the grocery store, they're thinking, oh, I have a customer. Let me go ahead and check them out. That's it. The bigger issue is this. There are times when people look at you or talk to you and think not nice things about you. They do think, oh, that dress is ugly, or I can't believe he wore that tie, or, you know, he needs to dye his hair, or she needs to, you know, wear different shoes, or whatever. Who cares? We do so many programs on this. When I say who cares, I mean seriously. You don't think, look, it's, there's, there's what, over 7 billion people on the planet. All of them are not thinking about you. The few that encounter you usually think about you in relationship to themselves. If people do think things about you that aren't nice, what does it matter? If you like the shoes, wear the shoes. But I see it ties to the second part of our approval definition. You want permission from them. You don't want to wear their shoes unless everybody else likes the shoes. There are no shoes on this planet you can wear that everybody thinks are great. There's too many people and there's too much of a diversity of opinion. Some people like big shoes and some people like little shoes. Some people like bright colored shoes. Some people like dark colored shoes. Some people love shows, shoes you can show your toes. Some people hate seeing toes. All of this is just the variety of the world and none of it's logical. But it, none of it has anything to do with the shoes or your or how in shape you are or how out of shape you are or how young you are or any of it. All this has to do with your just basic belief. You're not good enough. And so then you just you just extend it to everything. Oh, my shoes were ugly. Oh, I shouldn't have worn that tie. Oh, no wonder nobody likes me. That, you know, women don't like my car. I mean, none of this makes any sense. And when I say none of it makes any sense, um, there are a lot of different resources. I strongly suggest that you get out there. Look in the show notes. I'll put some links. But there's a lot of work on what they uh, call cognitive behavioral therapy. This is, again, not my – I've studied a reasonable amount of – psychology but i'm not at all professional in this area um but there's some self-help books that are written by psychologists who are and the idea is to try to examine your thinking and write down your thinking and start to test sort of the the hypothesis that you put out there for your thinking exactly what i'm saying it's not logical seven billion people think about you it's not logical everybody on the planet would like your shoes it's not logical that women you know if you're a single person, you want to date a woman and that they only like cars. And if you don't have a certain kind of car and want to like, it's not logical because then everybody would have to have that car, right? It's not logical. So it's all about examining. And this is my own very lay person interpretation of this. You're in, 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 and critically challenging these, these ideas. Does that make sense logically? Cause if it doesn't, then we have to reassess whether or not it's accurate by doing this. It's trying to help people 
reprogram their narratives. So if your narrative is I'm not good enough and you go through your world and you're just obsessed with this. Oh, the people at the store. Oh, everybody at the office. Oh, somebody on the freeway looked at me. Oh, I was, you know, it's just you never stop. And what a poor quality of life you have. Forget about surpassing our goals. We can't even get anywhere near meeting any goals. And while doing this, this obsession with negativity, you also bring other people into it. Anybody who tries to be close to you or your friend or your family member, your children, your parents, your loved ones, your coworkers, anybody who wants to care about you is just sucked into this place where we can't have anything positive because we're all supposed to agree that you're not valuable. If we didn't think you were valuable, we wouldn't be your friend. Again, it's not logical, but this creates so much pain. So big picture, you have choices, whether you believe it or not. I'm making that assertion you do. You can accept this and stay this way and sort of a laugh it off, which people do all the time. Ah, it's not that big of a deal. Yes, it is. It's a huge deal. This is your life. This is your chance. This is your shot. Why not make it better? You may be able on your own. Like I said, there's a lot of great material out to the public from experts in the field that could potentially help you. That may be enough. It may not. You may want to seek out other groups or support or professional um, to work with you individually so you can change this. It is changeable. I am telling you it is. But you either stay like this or you change. Staying like this where you claim you're addicted to approval is just... You hurt the people who care about you all the time. And I know that then people will say, well, that's why I'm not good enough. Stop. Stop this. This is changing these thoughts. You might need professional help or or groups or, and I don't care if they're, you know, religious or spiritual or whoever it is that can, you feel is part of this journey with you. But the changing of the thought itself is free. It's in your head. So I don't, what's, what's the reason not to do it? And here's the deal. If, if this is inaccurate information, if you read what the experts say and you do it and you change your thought and you change from, I'm not good enough to, oh, I am good enough. What, what have you lost? Let's say you try it and you, and you say to yourself, well, who knows if I like that lifestyle where it's, where I'm good enough. And I'm thinking about other things like, you know, more joy and being of service and, and that in my, and being, um, able to, uh, surpass new goals who cares what if i try that life and i hate it okay well here's the deal it's like anything else if you try the new life let's say you go over you do the switch or in your, t- in your new belief is i am good enough it's going to free up a lot of your time because so much of your time now is spending all these you know elaborate um me 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 all about me 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 more about me you're going to free up a huge amount of time because you're not going to be doing that because it's already been answered good enough now we have to move on to something else it'll free up time potentially like i said to for for family friends loved ones um pets uh social work volunteer more paid paid job vacation i don't care what it is but um exercise like anything but it'll free up a lot of your mental time that you put into this very elaborately constructed reinforcing that you're not good enough. I strongly encourage you to try it. If you don't like it, then you can go back, right? It's free. It's all in your head. So try it. It's like somebody says to me, oh, I don't want to eat that food. I've never had it, but it looks horrible. You don't know if you're not going to like it until you eat it. Eat it. If you don't like it, then don't ever eat it again. Problem solved. But if you don't try it, you don't know. I am begging you to try it. You need to try, convert over to the system of I believe I'm good enough, and then just try it. I believe you're going to see so many positive outcomes and you're going to accept that system and stick with it because it makes your life easier. It makes everybody else's life easier. It makes everybody's life better. It makes it happier. It makes it less stressful. It makes it more enjoyable. It makes it more stable. But why not try? So as we conclude this, I again want to thank you. It means so much to me that you take time to be part of our program. Uh, again, I, as emphatically as I possibly can, I'm encouraging you, try this new belief, which is I'm good enough. That's it. That's the end of it. Not I'm good enough if I get new shoes. I'm good enough if I lose 30 pounds. I'm good enough. No, no, no. I'm, I am good enough now. Done. Period. End of sentence. It's declaratory. I'm finished. <laughs> That's it. And then, and then try it. And I, I think when you try that, you're going to see so many positive outcomes that you're going to assess that this is probably a healthier, safer, better um, way for you to live. But this is not something you can take lightly. It's not at all. 
something that's minor. It's a major issue. As always, I encourage you to come to CourtneyAnderson.com, and I thank you for your time today.